Hello, listeners. <laughs> no. <laughs> you might be wondering, what the hell are they doing in my notifications? It is not Thursday. And to that I say, have we always been consistent? <laughs> not really. No. Not. Not even once. I mean... Once. Once. Maybe once. We were so good. We were on track. We were moving and we get a, we got a couple bucks. We got a little derailed. But you know what, you guys? Sherry has graduated college. She is a full adult human now. But you know what? She was before. But she was working a full-time job. She had this little side hustle called the Chalk Line. I don't know if you've heard about it. <laughs> all in all, I know that we've been a little rocky lately. So we decided to come into your notifications with an extra that you deserve. A little treat for y'all for the holidays, because we care. And here it is. Here is the Chalkline Christmas special. It's a little different than anything we've ever done. And we're just going to ride it. Yeah. We're just going to ride it on through. We are coming at you with the murder of John Bonet Ramsey. And before anyone just gets all up in our business about this case and how it's been covered a thousand times, we know. We, we know. know. But But you haven't heard our perspective on it. Or you have, because you're my friend who hears me talk about it a lot. <laughs> I don't know. Right. You could be the one of, like, the three people I bother on a daily about yeah. random <laughs> But for those who or don't. Or you have, because you're Matt and you just listen to <laughs> us talk about it for two hours. <laughs> Poor thing. But he was so good at playing devil's advocate. Oh, my God. Not okay with me. Oh, what are you, a defense could... attorney? I was like, Matt, listen. I know you work for the defense, but... <laughs> But I am just trying to prosecute cool. you. Yeah. I, you're getting and you're mucking up my business. You're not a part of my agenda. No, yeah. thank you. Now, as many of you know, unfortunately, John Bonet Ramsey was killed on Christmas. And we've kind of wanted to cover this case, but didn't really know how. And so we thought, what well, better of a time to honor John Bonet than to put it out as a Christmas special and kind of do it a little differently because she deserves a little bit of a different take than she's been getting, I think. Agreed. I think especially lately now that um TikTok has a whole crime talk. Oh my god. I think people <laughs> yeah. people just love the trendy the brother did it and oh, like people yeah. love to act like it's the solidest thing and we're here to debunk that. Yeah. And we're here to debunk everything. And I think that's what initially drew people initially drew people to the case and i think that's what still draws people to the case is that the focus is so much so on the family so let's get into that we are your hosts helen allen and sherry ferreira this is the chalk line good evening everyone and the highlights of the news this thursday Okay, so what we're doing differently this time is we are not really talking about research that we've done. Um, Usually with our episodes, we take a bunch of sources into account, we do a bunch of research, and then we come to you with the culmination of everything that we have read and learned. This particular case, we are just going to talk about the 2020 special on John Bonet because I feel... And Sherry, I think you can agree. Um, most of the specials just point at the family. And this one adds a little bit of a different take to it. And it investigates the intruder theory that not a lot of people might know about. Yeah. Agreed. Like every other special documentary, two-part series, whatever, focuses on either the family doing it or the brother or just Mm -hmm. a random person that really doesn't have anything to do with the case at all. Right, like, people that we don't- we know now are not, like, suspects to this day. And it's like, so why are we still talking about this crazy (laughs) man? Why are we still saying his name when we know that he didn't do it because he was in a different state? Yeah. People who in the same breath, they'll be like, but the DNA didn't match, so he's not a part of this. And I'm like, okay. So why'd you waste my time? I don't... So we're not here to waste your time. Yeah. <laughs> essentially. So let's get right into this. This episode is 2020. It's called The List. Mm-hmm. Who Killed John JonBenet Ramsey? And first of all, starting this episode, 
Um, you know how 2020 does that, like, montage of, like, what they... Oh, the voice recordings of John so Bonet, John Bonet, one of John the Bonet. anchors at one point goes, we the media, I guess she was, like, a new... I'm like, no, 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 no. That was not my cup of tea. We are not rewriting the Constitution. <laughs> this this was like, is we a the... 2020 episode. Let's not get it twisted. Yeah. It started me off on a, a very hot level. Because yeah. <laughs> we were calm before this. Right. <laughs> I mean, naturally, I'm never calm, but it's fine. We get right into it, and it goes through, and Patsy Ramsey is kind of one of the first people to speak, speak. on John Bonet and And Patsy Ramsey is the mother, just so everyone knows. Um, what did you think of this? Okay, when she was first giving her statements of her, I honestly loved it. <laughs> she was like, she was a ball of fire, and I don't know why that touched me in a certain, like, it just, I was like, ooh, that is, yeah, that's such a, like, she, nice way yeah. to like talk about her, especially knowing everything that she's done and accomplished. After I was like, oh my god! Great. Right. Well, I mean, John Bonet, for everyone who doesn't know, is a performer. She does pageants. I mean, how can you not know that? Yeah. If, you, if the case is new to you, she does pageants and um, talent shows. She was rock climbing. I was like well, at yeah. six. So Are you that me? was my thing. Is I didn't know how to feel about this specifically because when the mother is talking about John Bonet. She's talking about all these things that are not really, like, they're just, like, physical things. Like, she's like, yeah, she she's a rock climber. She's a hula hooper. She can stand on her head. And I'm like, did you forget to say smart and, like, Yeah, loving? just, like, other like, traits. I don't know. The, the, like, very heartfelt traits that I would want to talk about my kid as. But, but, like, I'm not a mom, so I don't know. But in the play Devil's Advocate, I worked in a school of young children that were like preschool age kindergarten and I know that parents love to talk about like the little victories yeah so I know hula hooping probably like when John Bonet was able to hula hoop for the first time it was like a huge thing that sticks with the mom so I did pick that up yeah oh then we get into it and there's these like two podcast girls yeah to which I say who are they who I are they? truly I was like and not us I don't right. know what business does 2020 have? I know we weren't on this scene yet, but... <laughs> it was it was a little heartbreaking. It was shattering, whatever. But they end up... They're like, girl, are you on the scene now? I don't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm listening. I'm like, oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> These two girls end up being the granddaughters of a detective who was on the case back when it was on and popping in 1996. He Lou was, Smith. Yeah, Lou Smith. Lou Smith. Uh, yeah, initially I was like, do we trust these girls to be in a 2020 episode? And you literally go, should I be writing these facts down? Do we know that these <laughs> girls are right? And then they're like, yeah, their grandfather asked them to carry out this case after he passed away. And we were both like, okay, oh, sh- <laughs> we trust them. Yeah. We're good to go. <laughs> Their podcast is called um, A Victim Shoe. The Shoot. Victim's Shoes. The Victim's yeah. Shoes. Yeah, they, they said it was, like, specifically something that Lou Smith, their grandfather, would say. Um, so they just kind of wanted to honor him and continue his legacy, which was investigating the murder of John Bonet. Now, I don't, I didn't write down who said this, but I just, I need to, like, pick at something again. Okay. So uh, one of the people in the documentary were, like, talking there, and they go... Yeah, there's John Ramsey, the father. He had interest in sailing. And then there was the... And, and he had interest in sailing and flying. And then there was the mother, Patsy. And that was the end of Patsy's existence. And she I'm was like, the mother. Are we throwing shade on Patsy? Are we saying the woman's place is in the kitchen? Or yeah. what? Like, I don't... It just felt very... Okay, you guys, does Patsy not get to have hobbies because she's the mother? Right. I don't, it was so weird the way he said it. It's okay. It was a fleeting thought. It also <laughs> looked like a pretty old clip. So, like, whatever right. you that you want to take. But he also, was, it's like, not okay back then either. But I'm like, <laughs> what does Patsy like to do? We get into the family a little bit more and we find out that they're rich as hell. The house has, like, 18 bedrooms. I mean, they're loaded. And they made a point to be like... There's a Christmas tree in every room at this time of year. But yeah, and then, and they're like, <laughs> I don't know. They're just talking about the house and the Christmas trees. And I forgot which documentary I was watching. I was like, is this an episode of HGTV? Because I am living for this. And then I was like, okay, girl, put your head back on. You are watching a murder documentary. Right. 
we find out a little bit more about like the family and we find out the mother like had recently come back from stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this happens around the holidays or on Christmas. So they had like a reason to be celebrating. Right. And they were really hyped up. Right. And, and regardless, they love Christmas. And I think that this is just a very theatrical family. Like they, in Ooh, they just in are, general, right? Yeah, because so I think they love to put on the show of, like, being the most decorated house and all that stuff, and, and, and it's no shade to them for that, because literally, like, some people just really love, like, being decked out and having the theatrics of Christmas, but I definitely think this is the type of family... And, like, it kind of attests to why she was in pageants, because I think they just like that stuff. Not even to perform, necessarily, but I even think just to, like, entertain, like, they had these home videos of the mother showing, like the house and being like the, I'm the mom my name is this it's my daughter John Bonet, my son Burke and this is our house and Christmas and like literally going through each room of the home yeah okay so when it came to making a podcast we knew what we wanted to do but we just didn't really know how to execute it if you haven't heard about anchor it's the easiest way to make a podcast let me explain it's free There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from this podcast too, like with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And so then we get some input from Diane Diamond, who is my hero. (laughs) No, not really. Well, kind of. She, there are some things she says that I'm like, Diane, girl, oh my goodness, you don't hold back. (laughs) But she said, like, quote, if we hadn't seen the beauty pageant photos of John Bonet Ramsey, it would have gone down as just another murder. To which I say, Diane, girl, put your claws away. I, just another murder. She's still six, no matter if she was in a pageant or not. But I can say that I do think America was so pissed because of the element of like, well, what was this six-year-old doing in those pageants? I think it made people more mad at the family because they were like, well, if you would put your kid into a pageant, then did you do this? But it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Those are two things you cannot compare. And that's just a huge jump. You're leaving. You haven't seen Little Miss Sunshine here. I can see you. Okay. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> right. And that was a big part of it was once these videos started coming out of her being in these pageant shows right. and these like sparkly outfits, a full face of makeup, people immediately started like persecuting the family. Right. Like they were like, what is this girl doing in lipstick? I don't even know how mm-hmm. to apply it to myself. How do you apply right. lipstick to a six year old? <laughs> I'm still wondering. No shade, but I am just wondering. I'm not very good at putting on makeup right. if, if anyone got that hit. <laughs> Like, this was actually a call for help. Truly, I'm just jealous. <laughs> John Bellet looks so good. She just looks so good. I don't... She's adorable. Like, so, let's get to the morning of the 25th. The kids, John Bonet and her brother Burke, were living in the home at the time. She also has an older half-brother named John Andrew, um, but he, I believe, was 23 at the time, and so he was not living at home. Um, which is why he doesn't come up, like, as a suspect in the family or whatever. Um, but anyway, so John Bonet and Burke had friends over the morning of Christmas, and they had a pretty normal day, a normal Christmas. They celebrated, and then I believe they tucked her into bed around 10 p.m., maybe a little earlier. Yeah, they had just come home from another Christmas party that they attended, like, their day was Mm jam-packed. And like you said, they put, um, her to bed at 10. Yeah. So then we get to the morning of the 26th. Patsy goes downstairs and she finds three pages on the stairway, to which I say, three? (laughs) Okay, everybody, it's a ransom note. (laughs) Obviously, this is very scary, but what's your first thought? Way too many pages. Three of them? Three pages. I'm sorry, but if you could, you couldn't pay me to sit down and handwrite three pages. No. Well, I guess that's what he was asking for. Right. For you to pay him for writing three three pages. pages. So then Patsy finds this ransom note and she's like, what in God's name? And she calls 911 like anybody would do. Mm -hmm. Basically, she says, like, 
police. We live at da 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 house. We have a cat kidnapping. There's a note left. My daughter is gone, and there's a ransom note here. And, like, call it, she's very frantic. Clearly very frantic. Yeah. After she calls the police, which they show up nearly immediately, um, she calls friends also, and everyone comes to the house as soon as possible, and they just kind of search the scene. They're, like, find, trying to find clues. They're walking everywhere. Oh, my God. These people are trampling in God knows what all over the place. You guys, this is a crime scene, whether or not it's a murder scene yet. It is a crime scene because a child was taken and you could still find hints. And let me tell you, friends of Patsy's were windexing the sink and the counters Windows. and washing dishes and making toast. I guess they said making <laughs> toast. To what in... Who is hungry? Who is hungry during all this? I think that's, like, people's immediate response. They're like, oh, my God, like, something tragic happened. Here's a casserole made out of I don't know what. But, like, make it at your own damn house, Betsy, and then bring it over. I don't... Why are you making toast in her house? I don't know. I thought it was so weird. I was like, are you, like... John Bernay hasn't been gone for 10 hours, and we are sitting in her kitchen making toast? I don't... It doesn't add yeah. up. It does not add up. <laughs> make it make sense. I... Ooh. Naturally, we can we can say um, everybody did a bad job here. Right. From the get, this scene was not treated As properly. A, yeah. Patsy in an interview then says, I believe she's speaking to Barbara. Um, Barbara Walters. Um, we're close. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> I'm like so on edge right now. Um, she says, what we have learned is that people should have been sequestered. They shouldn't have been roaming the house. To which I say, sorry, Patsy girl, I can't agree with you. What? They shouldn't have been roaming the house. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Patsy, what if one of your friends was the kidnapper and then they just went into that house happily to hide things that they could have? Like, they're cleaning up their trash. You know what? I bet one of her friends that were Windexing. No, I don't. I, I'm not going to no, say it. No, let's but, not but leave. What but if like, one of her friends that were Windexing were the kidnapper? They'd know exactly what a Windex and in a lot of cases like this, it is someone close to the family. And it didn't even happen that long ago. So you can make the argument for they didn't know. Like DNA evidence wasn't around. Like, but no, it's literally better. common knowledge, though, because even when DNA evidence wasn't around, they did have fingerprint data. So like fingerprints are still a thing that they would think are common knowledge at this point. I don't. I just don't even get it. And like if the police came nearly immediately, why did they let the friends in? Why did they let the friends stay? Like, the friends stayed well after the police did. Mm. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. No, from the start, every that's one contention. Is that the right word? Right. Everyone has about this. Is that right. n it was not treated fairly. Right. So here's the next point, um, which we kind of already glossed over. Diane Diamond gets to this point. She's like, this note was too damn long. A ransom note would not get to the... Uh, no, no, no. When people write ransom notes, they get to the point. Yeah. They're like, I want this much and I'll let you know when I'm going to call you back. And I'm like writing down these quotes of everybody who's saying like, this ransom note was too long. And then I just wrote, okay, LMAO, now everyone is <laughs> on it. Because I just <laughs> didn't know who to quote anymore. My fingers can't type that fast. Everybody was mad. Yeah, but everyone agreed that if it it's were- It's too long. Yeah, it's too long to have been written by just a random person that broke into the home. Exactly. Because here's the thing. You put yourself in the position of a frantic killer. I know, obviously, that's like a weird thing to say, but like, bear with me. If you just did a thing that could put you away in prison for the rest of your life, wouldn't you want to hustle your out of there? You would not take your time to write a three-page letter because you wouldn't know how much time you had to write a three-page letter. Right. I talk about this later in my notes, but I feel like it might do it justice to say it now. They do find the pad of paper that the ransom note was written on. And the pen. And the pen. And it is just a few feet away from where the ransom letters were found. What we're getting here is that... The killer took the pen and paper from inside the home and wrote the ransom letter inside the home. Even more so that they find a practice note. Yes. Uh, they had, like, started it and disposed of it and then restarted. This killer is very comfy. Mm -hmm. This or They have this their feet up on the couch. Writer. They're like, I am drinking wondering, some tea. Did they pour themselves a glass of wine? <laughs> 
And where is the evidence of that? Because what in God's name are they doing cozying up this much? Right. Now, in the ransom note, they do say, like... They say a lot. Well, yeah, and the way note. too much. Oh, okay. I'm not, that would be half the episode is just me reading a those... Sh- on the letter. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, to the biggest point, they say, we'd like $118,000, please. <laughs> when I first heard that, I was like, What? That's way too specific. Round up or down, honey? Yeah. What is that? 118. Yeah, I know it's an even number, but what like, is that's, that? that's Are you a looking lot. to buy a very yeah. specific house? I don't. <laughs> like, I just saw you this paying on off Zillow. your college debt? Did you go to University of Delaware also? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but then we find out that John Ramsey got a bonus from his company for $118,000. Which leads them to believe how much how many people would know that well i'll tell you what i know my christmas bonus and maybe my bookkeeping department at my work but like really not a lot of people yeah so i don't know who and like i also have to think like how soon how like many days were in between when he got his christmas bonus and now so like how much time was there even for someone to figure it out yeah that's a good point um, so that's, that's the first sketchy thing about mm-hmm. the, well, besides how long it was, but. <laughs> and besides the contents of it. Um, right. So about the contents of it, do you want to speak on that a little Yes. Long? Okay. So recently in that, I don't know if it's that same, it is in the same town in Boulder, there was a movie playing called Ransom mm-hmm. and in it, it makes a lot of references to the same verbiage. That was in the ransom note. So in the note, it said, don't try to grow a brain, John. But then in the actual ransom movie, it the quote is, do not attempt to grow a brain. So like very similar wording. Who watched that movie and then made this right after? Yeah. But here we are to tell you that that does happen. People watch movies and get inspired by mm-hmm. it. Because remember that one case? Oh that my we god, did. yes, where the, the husband one... literally watched the movie that inspired him to kill his wife. Mm-hmm. And oh my god, and the screen case. That was a few weird things about the no. I mean, there are a couple more instances where they're really specific with how much bills that they should have, like have a hundred, one hundred bills and Right. It was super specific and and it also like <laughs> at one point it says like if you tell the police you will be 99% chance of, you'll have a 99% chance of killing your daughter. But if you don't tell the police, you then have you've a 100%, 100% chance. T- and I'm like, is this a hand sanitizer ad? 99% chance? What? Is you a birth me, you're like, ad? is this like a commercial for Purell? I don't, I don't get uh, this. But like, what? Who wrote this? It was, it was a very, very strange. Did we look into the math teachers in Boulder? Right. I don't... <laughs> But a lot of the weird stuff in the letter just goes to show either, at least for me, this person was very smart in thinking that this would throw off the cops Mm -hmm. and detectives, or that they were just that dumb. Right. So, okay, so let's move on, because at this point, it is still just a kidnapping. Exactly. As far as we know. So, Detective Linda Arndt was actually just left at the house by the rest of the police officers just, like, yeah. Got up and left. They left around 9.30, 9.35. Right, which the ransom note had said that they were supposed to expect a call between 8 and 10 a.m. So Linda Arndt is kind of just waiting there with them to, like, hold out for that call that may come. And um, the call doesn't come, and she's starting to get a little weirded out by John Ramsey because he's, like, checking the mail and stuff. But which... I don't know if that's weird because, like, maybe he was, like, nervous that there was going to be another note or something. Yeah. I don't know that checking the mail seems weird to me, but I'm not writing it out. Like, if if Linda's police spidey senses made her mm. feel weird about it, then, like, okay, that's fine. I wasn't yeah. there. So she gets freaked out by it a little. So she's like, John, why don't you just go look around the house and see if there's anything missing or anything strange because... Maybe you'll find a clue that other people would have missed because yeah. you know what your house is like more than at, anyone else. Because at this point, they're thinking, okay, they were here because they needed money. So they're like, go check to see if anything valuable was like missing. Right. Or even like, maybe if, if this was someone like close to the family, maybe they would have like taken some like security items from John Bonet, like things to bring with her to make her calm while they're keeping her. So they, she tells him to go and he goes down to the basement with a friend and 
unfortunately, is when he finds John Bonet's body. Now, at this point, Linda says she checked how many bullets were in her gun because she felt unsafe in the house with John and Patsy Ramsey. So, I don't know the particular vibe, but I can <laughs> assume as a police officer, and they do make it a point to say she was not a homicide officer. Mm -hmm. So, now there's a dead body, and she's like, oh god, I just thought that I was waiting on a ransom call, and there's a dead body in the house... I don't know who killed her, and right, I'm she starts to look around at the people around her. She's like, I don't know who has been cleared, who has not been cleared, because at right. this point, no one has. She's like, these are the only people that have been here, as far as I know. And I even believe a few friends were at the home still at right. this time. So she's very on edge, and the interview I believe is from like two thousand, and she visibly is still getting like choked up over yes. this. Elizabeth Vargas weighs in on this. She's just like, oh um, my an god, anchor that like oh my has god. opinions. And she was like, it was shocking to me that she would think like that she needed to check how many bullets were in her gun. And Irrit I'm like, oh my god, why? irritated my soul. I was like, why, why is, is that, that shocking? shocking? I just don't. She didn't pull it out and start like she was aiming in a high stress she situation. Counted. She wanted to make sure that she was prepared for anything. So the next thing that happens is. Well, interesting yeah. yeah so you know okay everybody reacts differently when they see a person that they love um you know in the situation that john bonet's in she's on the ground of the basement unmoving right so as a father he obviously runs to her he grabs her and he, she has duct tape on her mouth and he rips it off because i mean I, I don't know that at this point he knew she was dead. So I think he obviously would want to, like, rip the duct tape off and, you know, kind of maintain any more, any life if she had any. But, you know, of course the, the crime nerd in me is <laughs> like, God, don't touch it! Yeah. But I have Just to like, understand. leave her the alone. I know, I'm like, that's a crime scene! <laughs> But, yeah, I, okay, that, fi fine, I don't have any issue with that, because I understand, grieving father, he's not in his right mind, he rips the duct tape off, even if he was in his right mind, he doesn't know that she's not breathing, and the best way to help her breathe is open up the airways. Yeah. So, fine. But then, he brings her body upstairs to the living room, where all of the friends are, mind you, and grabs a blanket from upstairs and wraps her in it. And he sort of, like, the way the um, documentary describes it is that he lays her on the living room floor and is almost, like, he doesn't say these words specifically, but it's almost like, there she is. Like, yeah, it's, like, showcasing her almost. Yeah. It's, like, the center of attention. It's, like, very theatrical. And the mother, Patsy, literally is, like, I went and I laid on her. And like, I'm, like, oh, great, because this crime <laughs> scene could have used more of that. <laughs> and here's that. the thing. I don't know whether this makes them guilty or not. I'm not here to decide that. But I was cringing hearing that he moved her body from the crime scene, as far as we know. And if you guys are big time listeners of us, <laughs> you'll know that we're always one to be like, you are you don't know how you're going to act under duress or grief, especially right. in situations like this. Yeah. But I think we both kind of came to the consensus, and correct me if I'm wrong, that I can understand and sympathize with him up to the point until he brings her upstairs and lays her on the floor. Yeah, because I don't know how to think about it, except for the fact that it feels theatrical mm, which might be right into their personalities exactly that's the thing is that they have enrolled her in all of these pageants they they themselves love to entertain they're just theatrical people so i don't know if this was just like an innate thing that he did um but you know on the very off chance that it isn't this feels like sick you know but, you know, there's, this isn't where I'm going to hang my hat. This is not the hill I'm dying Yeah, on. where I'm like, oh, it was them because of this one specific right. action. No. This, this, trust me, this doesn't even tip the bucket. <laughs> Let's get into what, unfortunately, I hate this part because let's, we need to talk about what actually happened to John Bonet. Yeah, and trigger warning for anyone who is 
I mean, this whole episode is a trigger warning. Oh, yeah. If you've gotten this far, what are you doing here? But trigger warning anyway. In case you needed it, and we're going to talk a lot about... It gets very heavy, and we'll try to do it in the least amount of, you know, we'll just do anything that's necessary, but the things that are unnecessary to say right now, we're not really going to get into it. So, her skull showed an eight-inch fracture, which... I don't know if everybody here listening is familiar with children's skulls, but eight inches is, like, I would imagine almost the whole thing. Yeah. I, that's Quite literally, they say that it would have taken a massive amount of blunt force trauma to cause this kind of damage. This is a major, major hit. Um, But ultimately, her cause of death was strangulation with a garret, which is... This, like, I guess it's kind of like a stick thing that you tie a string string or rope around. around. And it kind of is, like, the stick is then the handle. And then the rope, like, ends up going around her neck. So in this specific case, the thing that was used for the stick was a piece of a paintbrush. Um, And there are signs that she had been... attempting to remove it because there's like ligature marks around her neck um which led them to believe that she was alive and then this is why it is her cause of death broken pieces of the paintbrush were also recovered that showed that they were used to sexually assault her and you know this whole thing is just really heartbreaking but then they do go into discussing like what kind of killer would do this Mm -hmm. which is vital to figuring out who could have done this right which is why we bring it up the very smart people who are like fbi profilers and you know people that work in this business for a long time are able to kind of determine like what exactly the type of person that that did this and they kind of say that the killer is someone who's feeding off of like theatrics yeah and i hate like for a lack of a better word because i know i've been saying the word theatric and i don't want to put anybody (laughs) in a box here but no but like we obviously know it's more than just the stereotype of a theatric. It's just someone who likes to present right. their work. Which, you know, makes a lot of people think. And, like, I personally considered, like, okay, if this serial killer or if this killer um, feeds off of theatrics, like, could this be one last theatric bringing her body up to the living room? Which is, we talked about a lot. And, I mean, it is... A possibility. Yeah. I mean, and I'll just say, I'm just putting out anything and everything here because I don't even think it was the dad. And I know that might be alarming to hear after I've been <laughs> literally charging after him, but like, I don't even think it was him. I truly don't. But I'm just saying that this is, this is maybe what people would think. Yeah. And a lot of their actions sort of point toward them doing it. And I yeah. think this is one. But I mean, people are dissecting the hell out of it. Every including little me and thing. You. And so... I think, like, if everybody dissects every move I make, they're oh, going to come up with a yeah. lot of issues. And you, you, know? you, you, naturally. And I'm sure my <laughs> listeners, they're like, Helen, girl, we do. Yeah. And like, <laughs> they're like, you're the paranoid one. We got we that. We do dissect <laughs> everything you say, and you need help. <laughs> Lots of it. So we're just saying, like, that's what we're doing here. Yeah. They look at the scene, and there's really no evidence of a break-in. So ultimately, the police at this point... Are just like, okay, well, could the parents have done this? Could they have planned this? I mean, they jump on the parents immediately, especially especially after those videos of John Bonet being in pageants begin to go viral. They're like, oh, it was the parents for sure. Right, right. So, and now the detectives are, like, ready. They're like, let's go interview the Ramses before they get the chance to, like, get their story straight. And also, um, John Andrew, who is John Bonet's half brother, he makes a very good point. Um, he says like the OJ case like just wrapped up and the twenty four hour news cycle is like he called it dried up. And essentially they're like looking for something new. So the media is like so eager to run with this case. Like they're yeah. And you know how the media goes, like as soon as they hear a case, they, they're like, okay, but where's the answers? So they're trying to figure out the answers, and everyone is so ready to pin it on the family. We do find out that the paintbrush and basically everything at the scene of the crime was, like, items found from the home. So right. the paintbrush came from the mom's art supply kit, mm-hmm. and the same with the 
um, duct tape that was found over her mouth. Yes, and like we said, the ransom note materials were also found literally a few feet away from the location that the ransom note was found in the first place. And, you know, they do make note to say that, like, most children who die at this age tend to die by their parents. So it's not uncalled for that the family is being looked into, but, you know, it does become just kind of a media circus about it, essentially. Mm -hmm. So they also um, do say that Patsy's clothing fibers were found on the duct tape that was on John Bonet's mouth. And now <laughs> they say this, but in the same breath, they're like, "But that could just be because Patsy lives in the house." Mm-hmm. And it's like, "Okay, you need to stop leading me around." Why'd you tell me <laughs> that then? Like, I just wrote that down. Essentially, I think a lot of people think that they hear that patsy's clothing fibers were on the dna or on the duct tape how did it get there and it's like well maybe just that's their duct tape and patsy's touched it before it is weird because later in an interview she says she doesn't remember ever buying that duct tape but that interview that she says that it's like years later so it's like of course she doesn't i don't remember last time i purchased tape (laughs) what sorry i didn't write it down what yeah so it's a weird point in the case yeah so by new year's eve um john bonnet is laid to rest just outside of Atlanta, atlanta georgia which is where the family originates from uh before this the father does give sort of an informal interview with police where he does give over some dna and answer a few questions but at this point it is nothing formal and they're not interrogating him at all right. and they're even told by their lawyers to not talk to police at all yes so then the day after john Bonet's funeral you could imagine the police are very freaked out to see the ramses sitting down for a television interview with cnn to which diane diamond is not cool with she is like hello oh. and she mocks this heavily mm. she literally was like <laughs> I, oh, I don't remember. They, they should be talking to the police, not the public. Yeah. She's, like, so mad. She's like, why would they do this if they thought they were going to be helping out? They should talk to the like, police. I was like, Diane, I was thinking the same thing. I don't... Oh, like, <laughs> calm down. But in the interview, they do, like, are very adamant saying that they didn't do it, and they plead with the public to please help them. And, you know, a lot of people, Elizabeth Vargas specifically, says... Many people found the Ramsey's behavior peculiar, suspicious, weird, shockingly off twisted. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because right before we watched this, we were talking about that Ted Bundy movie starring Zac Zac Efron, and we were like, "We can never just think of the title of that movie. What is it like? Shockingly ghastly, suspicious, <laughs> off-putting." And I'm like, then she said that, and Sherry's like, oh, that's just simply us thinking of the Ted Bundy movie's title. No, she was literally just naming synonyms for the word weird. Seriously, it was like, okay, I we get it, we get it. At this point, everyone's like, so what business did they have sitting down with CNN and not sitting down with the police? Because people are starting to think, like, okay, well, if this family is innocent, then don't they want to go to the police and have the police, like get all the information that they know, don't they want to, like, give their statements, whatever. But this you also have to play devil's advocate with because they're already up by against the police because the police have been hinting that they think that Patsy did it. Yeah. Like, they they are their only suspects. Right. And a lot of people took this, like, quote, bedwetting theory and ran with it. Oh, my God. Which is essentially, God. like, that Patsy had cancer at the time, so, like, her emotions were maybe not totally normal. Yeah, and apparently, like, John Bonet wetting the bed would make her just, like, snap and, like, Right, kill which is, her. like, I don't know if that's, like, a really great theory because, like, she has a nine-year-old, so she's obviously already been through the bedwetting thing. Yeah, and John Bonet's her second child that she's potty trained. Why would she break right now? Yeah. And in a brief moment of I was like, "You better get him." Um, she goes, "Bedwetting is totally insignificant, like compared to surviving cancer." And I'm like, "You better get him." Yeah, she was like, you "When you get have him. cancer, you pri- you line your priorities up." Sorry, bedwetting is not significant. After 
um, 10 days of searching the home, they do like remove the tape and suggest that they are done looking through the house and combing through everything that they had mm-hmm. with what, what, with what little was left really. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't know what they did come through, but whatever it was. Yeah. They're done with it. Right. <laughs> and the next thing I have is that, um, three months after John Benet's death, um, they're, the police are still on the mother and father. Mm-hmm. But the DA is, like, really adamant about slowing their investigation because he's, like, um, DA Alex Hunter. He says that he really wants someone new to come in and take over and, like, work the angle of an intruder. Right. Because they're so, like, tunnel visioned on the mother and the father and even the son, too, which is... Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so they're... Before we get into Luce and his theories, um, they do... They play the 911 call, and the 911 operator specifically thinks that she heard Burke Ramsey's voice on the call. And Burke mm-hmm. Ramsey is John Bonet's nine year old brother. And the parents claim adamantly that he was sleeping at this point. But the 911 reporter said, or operator says, that I guess like Patsy thought that she had hung up the phone. And so she says, okay, I've called the police. Now what? to someone um and they she believes the operator believes that she heard the um brother burke and then two other unnamed individuals well she says she thought she heard two people talking to her it's a male voice and then a faint voice responding so she thinks the male voice is obviously the husband john and then the faint voice is probably burke speaking yeah um and then they show us this, like, janky way to look at audio. Oh, my God. This... And I'm like, are you on GarageBand? <laughs> what is that? I don't... But ultimately, it comes up with nothing. And they're like, there's no way to say that there were voices behind her. And the FBI concludes that there's no ad- additional conversation that is audible. So I think maybe the 911 operator just, like... I mean, this is years later that she's saying this. It's like, you remember that? I don't mm-hmm. think you do. I like, think they you want track to remember down that. the same 911 operator and have yeah, her speak. I feel like you just want to remember that, sweetie girl. Yeah, but. So, and then, uh, one more thing. Um, they do, like, go back to hit their interview with Barbara Walters. This is, like, kind of fading in and out a lot during the episode. And they come to a part where John Ramsey says, would you get up in the middle of the night and slaughter your daughter? Right. And Um, I have feelings about that. Let's talk about it. (laughs) Ultimately, I think, I mean, I have lost people in my life. And I don't think, and I'm, listen, I'm not a parent. I have never lost a child. So I don't know. I'm not speaking from experience of that. But. When I speak of my lost loved ones, I don't use words that are so harsh. I thought that slaughter just didn't roll off his tongue nicely. I I thought it was, like, a very harsh word for a grieving parent to use. Um, And I would never want to put my six-year-old daughter in the same sentence as slaughter. Um, But I don't know because, like we always say, people do grieve differently. So maybe he's just in his anger phase of grief. And he's not really listening to himself speak. Like, but I, I just thought that was notable because it was like a very harsh way to speak of her, I thought. Agreed. And I mean, the interview is from this 2000 interview with Barbara Walters, Queen herself. Yeah. Um, but it is an interesting choice of words. Yeah. So I, again, I'm not too hung up on it, but it did like while I was watching it, I was just like, huh, okay. That doesn't really sit well with me. Right. <laughs> but. Moving on. Um, so, yes, like you said, the Boulder DA, Alex Hunter, um, is not okay with just hanging the parents out to dry and leaving it like that. So he does want to look into other options. I mean, they said that there are 38 to 40 sex offenders in the area of their home. So he's like, hello, let's mm-hmm. figure something out. There must be some other things to be looking into. So this is when he gets our friend Lou Smith on the case. Yeah, the the star the star of the, the documentary. Literally. I mean, the star. He is this detective who is just known for closing cases, and they bring him in to try and solve John Benet's. Right. Um, he is very much on the of the belief that an intruder broke into the home. Yes, and you know he wasn't initially. So this guy is what we love to see because he 
thinks something, and then he's presented with new information, and he's like, hey, guess what? I can change my opinion now, because I have new information. Yeah. This is something that we don't see a lot in law enforcement in these older cases, (laughs) and it's frustrating. So, Mm -hmm. Lou Smith, I just have to tip my hat to you. Not that I ever wear hats, but (laughs) if I did, I would tip it to you, Lou Smith. So, he literally, at first, was like, listen, if someone did get in that house, it was Santa going down the chimney. Right. And then he does a 180, and he's like, here's, you guys, this is the intruder theory. (laughs) And he literally does a demonstration of how someone could break into the basement through a window they had, sort of pop to the side. this is the ultimate scene. I (laughs) loved it. Because, okay, so the way that you have to get into that window It's, like, you have to pick up this, like, I I don't know, door thing that's, like, perpendicular to the ground. Almost like a a, grate. It's, like, parallel to the ground. It's on the ground, essentially. It's, like, a grate, yeah. And he, like, picks it up, like, it's, like, a storm door type pickup thing. And I'm explaining this horribly. No, you're doing a better job than I could. And um, then he, like, shimmies his way in. And then there's, like, the, so you're, then he's, like, standing a little lower into the ground. But then to his right... There's, like, this window that goes into the house from the, like, side ceiling-ish part of the basement. Yeah. And so then he opens that window and he's, like, shimmying on in. And it's it does not look easy. <laughs> and he does it. And he gets down and he stands there and he goes... See? It really wasn't that difficult getting in that window. And it, I go, Lou! <laughs> it looked like something an acrobat would have to do, but the way Lou... Climbed in with such ease. I mean, Lou is not a young man. He and was not. he just showed me the fuck up because I was going, there's no way he could get in that window. And he did it <laughs> beyond all odds. He said, Girl, I'm getting through that window and I'm showing you it's possible. And he did. And, he and did. it is possible. But if I were the intruder, oh my God. I'll tell please. you what. I looked up the house. Their bedroom, the parents' bedroom, was on the opposite side of the house as where John Bonet was found, but they would have heard me. Mm-hmm. In all 18 rooms, they would have heard me fall through that window. Be like, ah, 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 They'd be like, ah, ah, f- ah, ah, <laughs> 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 and Suddenly, we wouldn't have a mystery on our hands. Right. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. Lou Smith tells us it could be done. It can be done. But another thing Lou does know is that there were still cobwebs on the window. Um, this is when I was like, okay, I am a freak and a nerd. Because as we see... <laughs> as My name's Hollis and I'm a freak and a nerd. Hi, freak and a nerd. <laughs> as we see... The one guy questioned it. He's like, okay, Lou, but guess what? There's cobwebs on the window. I'm thinking to myself, when was the crime scene picture taken? Because that's what they, they're seeing the crime scene picture, and they're like, well, there's cobwebs on the window. I'm thinking to myself, when was this picture taken? And I'm Googling. I literally Googled <laughs> how fast a spider can make a cobweb. And I'll tell you what, guys, 30 to 60 minutes. <laughs> 30 to 60 minutes. So, Lou Schmidt, this does not discount your theory because this guy could have hauled through that window and then 30 to 60 minutes later, a cobweb could have formed. Literally. A spider, a culprit to the crime, an accomplice. Charlotte. Charlotte herself. No, but it literally just goes to show that the cobweb could have been up at any point in that... Right, because by the point that that crime scene picture was taken, it was hours after the intruder would have left. Yeah. So, I'm not getting hung up on the spider webs, but guess who did? Lou Smith. No, not Lou Smith. Lou not Smith was like, I don't care about the spider webs. The okay, jury Not Lou Smith, the jury. But we're not getting <laughs> yeah, into that yet. <laughs> Alright, so they also, Lou Smith also notices that there are two strange marks on John Bonet's face and back that hadn't really been looked into before by the police. Now, he notices that these marks are the same distance apart than, you know, you would assume regular, I don't know, marks? Regular marks. But yeah. he's like, what are these doing? The the mark on his on her neck or on her face, was the exact same distance apart as the marks on her back. Because yeah. it's, like, two dots on her They're face like and these... two dots on her back. So, 
he comes to find, he, like, measures it and comes to find that it looks like it was done by a stun gun. He goes on to compare it to, like, stun guns that have been done on humans and pigs and find that they create the same marks. And he thinks there's no reason for the parents to have used a stun gun if it was them. So he's just finding right. more evidence of, like, the parents yeah. could not have done this. And honestly, when you first look at it, I wouldn't have even, like noticed it because there are these just like two small black dots right but he's also like hello things are usually what they seem let's not make this complicated if it looks like a stun gun and it walks like a stun gun it's a stun (laughs) gun (laughs) no but he's literally like it's a stun gun and guess what the parents didn't have a stun gun so we should be looking into ulterior theories right and that's ultimately what pushes him to be like It wasn't the family. And another thing that he, like, takes into account is that the DNA on John Bonet's body, which they found on, um, underneath her fingernails, her underwear, eventually her leggings, but we'll get more of that later on. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't match anyone in the family. Right. So So they're like, hello, let's be looking into other people. So the Ramseys ultimately get interrogated at a different police department later because... They refuse to be interviewed by the Boulder police. At this point, they're like, we don't trust them and we do not want to be interviewed by them because God knows what that'll be like. Right. And mind you, this is happening years later on terms that both they have agreed on and the police department have agreed Mm -hmm. on. So it's like a big... Right. So this actual interview takes place June 24th, 1998. So it's a year and a half after the murder. And the person interviewing Patsy questions her and he's like... What if I told you that there was evidence that links you to the death of John Bonet Ramsey? And she literally goes, That's impossible, go retest. I quote, she goes, Go back to the <laughs> drawing board. <laughs> and Diane Diamond goes, I am so taken with her swagger. I, I lost it. it. I I was like, her oh. swagger. Diane, I love you. I'm sorry, but I just love her. I she also goes, she's very feisty, she's very combative. combative, and I'm like, Diane, what side are you on? I Can you blame her? Diane, girl, it's been two and a half years, and the police refuse to look at anyone else except for her. I cannot blame her for being, it's been one and a half years, I mean, forgive me, but regardless, I cannot blame her for being pissed. Yeah, and it also was a different, um like, tone that she had taken on in previous interviews where she was, like, Mm -hmm. notably calm. Like, she really seemed, like, fed up. Yeah. And fed up, I think, is a great thing to say. Because I think that she was trying to keep her composure when she believed that there was going to be justice. Mm -hmm. But at this point, she's like, you guys are yanking my chain. Nobody's looking at anybody but me. So, I don't know. I don't blame her for being really feisty like diane says um dr steve pitt who interviewed john said i thought john was very measured and composed you don't see the drama and i go i do steve i see the drama i don't <laughs> steve this i've been seeing the fun. drama yeah. I don't... am i the drama what do you mean? <laughs> i think they're the drama so in this is the interview actually that made lou believe that it wasn't the parents and this is what made him feel so positive that the Ramseys were being targeted unfairly that this is really what made him resign from the case yeah um he said quote this case tells me john and patsy ramsey did not kill their daughter i intend to stand with this family and somehow help them through this and find the killer of their daughter so he resigned from the state's case Now we see they're putting together, like, a grand jury, and the grand jury is touring the Ramsey's house. Um, so the the jury, the grand jury is really starting to believe that, um, it was Patsy Ramsey. And I'll tell you what, they really hone in on the writing on the ransom note, um, and they ruled out John, John Ramsey from the writing on the ransom note. Um, But they could not rule out um, Patsy. And it wasn't because they could rule her in. Um, They just couldn't rule her out. And essentially, there was so much data being like, yeah, this could be anybody. But that made it not rule her out. And so that's like handwriting samples and handwriting analysis is just such 
to me. You've a hoax and a quack and another synonym and another synonym. I just, <laughs> it is bonkers bananas. I... Because after analyzing it, they are able to find some comparisons between whoever wrote the note and the mom Patsy's handwriting. But at the end of it, they're like, this was all done intentional. Like, in the beginning of their analysis. Yeah, she's like, whoever did this tried to conceal their writing. And it's like, that you told okay, me you everything I need to know. End it there. What? Period, point blank. And so, literally, what they're saying is the similarities are very general in nature. Like, literally just how everyone was taught to write. So, yeah. it's like, okay, yeah, of course, that's how she writes. Everyone was taught to write like that. Did you go to kindergarten? I don't... Right. So the second focus to the jury is the intruder theory, which was presented by Lou Smith. Now, the grand jury was not buying it because of the cobwebs, to which I tell them, hello, Google it, 30 to 60 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes. I am on your side, Lou. But, you know, the grand jury did essentially take all of that into account and decide that they should charge the Ramses. With the murder. Mm-hmm. However, the DA was like, Mm-mm, no, no, it's not a slam dunk. We're not sure. Let's not do it. I, Lou really thinks that the biggest piece of this case is the DNA. However, unfortunately, Lou Smith is not here with us today to see the advances of DNA come to fruition. I mean, nowadays we have touch DNA, which they even go through it. Touch DNA is essentially like every time you touch a surface, like skin cells are coming off of you and onto that surface and they can scrape the surface and get your DNA. Right. No one's safe. Hide your kids, hide your wife. kind of hilariously scary, (laughs) right? I'm horrified. So in 2008, the district attorney did a new round of DNA testing on John Bonet's PJ leggings and touch DNA and cover DNA from her leggings, which rules out again the family because there is this extra male on the DNA. This I don't know whether it's the same male, which was underneath the fingernails and the underwear, but it is a male that is not part of the family. Yeah. And, and it's also not any of the suspects that we've ever heard from this case. So, S- oh my god, a slew of just randos, and they're all... I terrible mean, human creepy, beings. Creepy, freaky people who, like, put them where you need to put them away from here, mm, please. But, they don't need to be in society. But at the same time, like, we're still looking for the guy. Exactly. Um, now, after Lou died, um, they did, you know, pass this case on to his daughter um, because he did not want the case to die with him. He wanted somebody else to be passionate about it. And keep the um, case alive, really. Like, right. So much so that she and passes it down to her daughters. Exactly. And that's where we go back to the podcasters. So it's a very sweet thing. These, this family has taken it upon themselves to get justice for John Bonet. Um, but before Lou died, he made sure to mumble a name to his daughter. And he said, girl, get him. Right. <laughs> He like, said, girl, I'm going to tell you, you, this case is bonkers bananas, but here's a name. And this is where Look you start. Look into it. He's, He's like, this is the name. This is where you start investigating. Because essentially, throughout his like time investigating this case, he compiles this huge database of suspects. Right. So he essentially wants them, or from what I took, they're working now to eliminate suspects off the list. And just, like, match DNA whenever they can. I mean, they even followed some people and got, like, cups that they left behind. And they're just working to get these people off that list. Yes. The the 2020 episode's very um, weird about it. They kind of walk on eggshells being like, is this it or is this it? But what they say at at, at its core is they say that the family has narrowed it down that they think there's only one person on this list that is not innocent. Mm-hmm. And then they tell us the name of someone, and but they don't say that that's the not innocent person. Yeah. So it's like, are we to believe that this is the not innocent person, or are you yanking my chain? Because... I think our chains are being yanked. But anyway, they, they get into this guy, Michael Helgoth, which he was very high on Lou Smith's list. Um, so Lou Smith did some digging, and he called Michael's friend, who had said that he had said in the past that he wanted to crack a human skull... And that him and a partner were going to make fifty or sixty thousand dollars. Unfortunately, this man committed suicide right after the DA threatened that he was close to finding the perp. But they do know that he did have a stun gun and he had quote high tech boots. 
Yeah, which I don't, I don't even know what to do. I'm not even getting into that. I don't know what that means. But (laughs) I have other fish to fry (laughs) than those boots. They do say that eventually his DNA does not match, and he doesn't really have a connection to the family, so it it goes against everything they think who the killer might be. Right. So ultimately, you guys, this 2020 episode left us just the same, exactly how I was in the first place. But if it did anything, I think it is important to give the angle that it is not the family. Because I think the family angle has been outdone. Beaten to the ground. Really? I'm like, I'm sorry, but can we leave them be? Burke Ramsey's interview with Dr. Phil that everyone is like really pressing into him on how he behaved. Guess what? He had 20 years of his life taken away from him because he was a suspect from nine years old. So if he's being weird, guess what? You guys made him that way. Yeah. (laughs) We should be done picking apart the family and we should just wait for science to find out. Which I truly think is what like is going to happen with this case. It's one of those things where we have to wait for science to evolve, wait until we get the right match. And ultimately that's how we're going to find who killed John Bonet Ramsey? Merry Christmas, you guys. Thanks for listening. You can catch us on Instagram at the Chalkline Pod, Twitter at the Chalkline Pod, and follow along with our YouTube channel. The link is in our Instagram bio. Tune in next Thursday for another story. Uh-huh.